2,000 years ago, at the end of the Second Temple era, there were two main schools of Jewish learning, Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. We've heard of this before, Hillel and Shammai, Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. So 2,000 years ago, the president of Israel, the Nasi, was Hillel, and the vice president was Shammai, and they came from two different schools. And Hillel's school was known to be more kind and lenient, and Shammai was more strict, more rigid, more, let's say, extremist. You know, from the school of Shammai came later the Kanaim, the zealots, who fought the, who kind of started the revolt, the great revolt against the Romans, and uh, yeah, and were fighting and were assassinating Roman uh, officials and so on. So Shammai was known to be more strict, stringent with the law, and Hillel was known to be a lot more lenient with the law. And Kabbalistically, we say that Hillel comes from the side of chesed, right, of kindness, of loving kindness, and Shammai comes from the side of gvura, of restraint, and din, of judgment. And if we remember previously, we discussed the story of the, fa- the famous story of the Gentile who wanted to convert, and he came to Shammai and he said, convert me while, I stand, while standing on one foot. Remember that story? And Shammai said, you know, get out of here. It's too difficult. You can't do it that fast. And he, he drove him away. And then he went to Hillel and asked Hillel to convert him on one foot. And Hillel, remember, he very quickly said, yeah, no problem. You know, just don't do unto others what you don't want done to, your, to you. And the rest is commentary, right? So Hillel was a lot more lenient. And Shammai was very strict. By the way, that story ends over there that several people... Uh, came to Hillel, and um, the, the conclusion is those people got together at the end and said that Hillel's kindness and gentle approach is what brought us under the wings of the Shekhinah. And had we listened to Shammai, we would have you know, never gotten closer to Hashem. So the Hillel approach is the approach that's always favored in rabbinic literature. And in the Talmud, the Mishnah Talmud, you have several hundred differences between Shammai, Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, they rule differently on Jewish laws. And almost always, Shammai is more stringent. Now, really, we have a tradition that Hillel and Shammai themselves didn't actually have so many differences. But their academies, after their lives, as their academies grew, their students became more, shifted more towards extremes and had a lot more differences. So, for, and, and there are many differences that are given, again, at least 300 or something in Jewish law. So, for example, in Masachet Brachot, this one, I'm, I'm pointing this one out because I think this is the one where if we would have followed Shammai, it would have been a lot more convenient because it says on Shabbat, let's when you do Kiddush, what is the order of doing Kiddush? Like we, the way we do it is we say Kiddush, then you go do Netilat Yadayim, and then you come back to the table and do Hamotzi. But Beit Shammai, Shammai taught that first you should go do Netilat Yadayim, then sit at the table, then do Kiddush, and then say Hamotzi, which is a lot more kind of logical sequence, more convenient, because then you don't have to get up. You know, like what we do is we all sit down, and you do your Kiddush, then everybody has to get up again, go and wash, and then come back to the table, and so it's a little inconvenient. So Shammai's approach was actually a little more convenient. First he said, Notlimi Le'adayim, Ve'achakach Mosgim Atakos. So first wash, then do Kiddush, and then you can do Hamotzi. So you kind of like save the trip. Oh, you could then change the order? No, we can't, because we follow Hillel. <laughs> but I'm saying 2,000 years ago, this was a debate between the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. That you know? So that's what I'm going to get to in a second. Another example, another famous example is, are you allowed to lie, like a white lie, for the sake of peace? So the classic example is, if you're at a wedding and the bride is there, do you tell her that she is beautiful if you don't think that she's beautiful? Right, so Hillel says you can tell a bride that she's beautiful on her wedding day, even if you don't think so, because, you know, it's her wedding day, so you've got to make her feel good. And Shammai... Wait, wait, that's good. So Shammai... Wait, hold on, you're jumping to conclusions. So Shammai is saying, no, you're never allowed to lie. Under no circumstances can you lie. So you want to make a bride happy on her wedding day, you know, tell her the flowers are nice or something. You can tell her the food, the food is good. <laughs> um, yeah, so Shammai is saying that you can't really lie under no circumstances, but Hillel said you can if it's for a good reason like this one. But like, like you were saying, yes, Hillel really implies that every bride is beautiful on her wedding day, objectively, you know, 
relative to her, even if you don't think so, even if you don't think so. So it's not really a lie because she did beautify herself, presumably for her wedding day. So anyway, it's another famous example of Hillel and Shammai. Now, as we know, the conclusion is that that the law always follows, Jewish law always follows Beit Hillel. How do we know? Uh, there's a famous passage in Masechet Eruvin. The Talmud says, Amar Rabbi Abba, Amar Shmuel, Shalosh shanim nechleku Beit Shammai uveit Hillel. That the schools of Hillel and the, the disciples of Shammai and disciples of Hillel debated for three years. They were divided on Jewish law for three years. They debated. Halalu omrim alacha kmoteinu, ve'alalu omrim alacha kmoteinu. Each side is saying, no, the alacha is the way we say each side was affirming that they were correct in their interpretation of Jewish law. And finally, after three years, what happened? Yatsa batkol, a voice came from heaven. A heavenly voice resounded, ve'amra, and said, Elu va'elu divrei Elohim chayim hen. Both are the word of God. Both are true. Both are correct. Both are divine in their own way. Both are the word of God coming to life. But the law goes according to Hillel. So a voice came from heaven to settle this debate. And a heavenly voice itself proclaimed that the law should always follow Hillel. Okay? And why, the Talmud continues, why did Hillel get the credit? If they're both divine, if they're both correct, why does Hillel win? So why did Beit Hillel merit to be the victors in this debate if they're both the word of God? Because they were very gentle, they were very modest, they were very compassionate. And they would learn not only their opinions, but also Beit Shammai's opinions. So they accepted both. You know, whereas Beit Shammai was not so much. Beit Shammai kind of said, this is it, we're right, and they didn't bother. Our way or the highway. Yeah, it was their way or the highway. Whereas Beit Hillel really tried to understand both sides and studied both ways, both methods, and they were very gentle and modest. And not only that, but they would even quote Beit Shammai before they quoted their own position. So they, really, they were very respectful of other opinions, they had more openness, and they prioritized the path of peace. Because we know from Pirkei Avot that Hillel, his whole thing was to, to prioritize peace, to follow the path of peace, to always try to make peace. So that's why Beit Hillel won, because they were the more respectful, more gentle, more peaceful, kinder path. They were the side of Chesed, and not the side of Gvura and Din. So, we follow Hillel, but can you go by Shammai if you wanted to? You know. Well, after that bat kol, <laughs> right. After, even after that, so the bat kol came and said you have to follow Hillel, but could you optionally, if it is also a divine opinion and is correct in its own way, can you choose to follow Shammai if you wanted to? And the Talmud gives us a story in Masechet Brachot of this is what happened. Uh, when it comes to Shema, when you say Shema, you're supposed to, the mitzvah is to say Shema twice a day, right? In the morning and in the evening. Why? Because the passage in the Shema itself says, When you lie down to go to sleep and when you rise in the morning, you have to say this affirmation that God is one. So, Beit Shammai Omrim, Beit Shammai would teach, When you say the evening Shema, you should lie down and then say Shema, like when you're lying down. And in the morning, you have to say the Shema as you get up, like standing up. Why? Because the Torah says, Because the Torah literally says that you should say Shema when you lie down and when you get up. So Shammai holds, being very strict and literal, you should lie down when you say the evening Shema, and you should stand up when you say the morning Shema. But Beit Hillel said, no, that's not really the case. Every person can say the Shema however they want, in whatever position you need to be in to say the Shema. Why? Because the verse says, right? which means you should say it on your way. Like depending on whatever derech you are in, that's how you should say the Shema. Okay, so, imken lama ne'emar kumecha. Why does the Torah say when you lie down and when you get up? Just in general, So generally, when people go to sleep, that's when you should say the evening Shema. And when people wake up in the morning, that's when you should say the morning Shema. 
Okay? You don't have to literally be lying down or standing up. You should just say it in those times when people generally lie down to go to bed and wake up in the morning. That's the, the, the dis- difference between Shammai and Hillel. Okay? And of course, again, the law is like Hillel. So you can be in any position you want when you say Shema. But the story continues like this. Amar Tarfon. So one of the rabbis, Rabbi Tarfon, Ani, says, Ani aiti He was on his way. So presumably it was evening now, and he wanted to go according to Beit Shammai, and he actually lay down to say the Shema, lying down. And what do you think happened? And gangsters came and started harassing him. Okay. So what did they tell him? Amrulo, the other sages told Rabbi Tarfon, Kidai ha'ita lechuv ba'atzmecha, you deserved it. You deserved to be beaten by thugs for doing that. Why? She'avarta al divrei Beit Hillel. Because you chose to follow Beit Shammai instead of going according to Beit Hillel like you're supposed to. So from this story we learn that you're not supposed to follow Beit Shammai. If you, even if you wanted to, you're supposed to go according to Beit Hillel. Because Rabbi Tarfon once thought that he'd go according to Shammai, and he was immediately accosted by gangsters, and the sages said that it was his divine punishment from heaven for breaking this rule, that you're supposed to go according to Hillel. Having said that, it seems like we shouldn't go according to Beit Shammai, but there are 18 laws that we do go according to Beit Shammai. To this day, there are 18 laws that people to this day follow according to Beit Shammai which is really strange. And in another place, in one of the places that discusses these 18 laws, in Masachat Avodah Zarah, it says something amazing. It says, not only do we follow these laws, but it says like this, that one Jewish court cannot nullify the decree of another Jewish court. So if one Jewish court pronounces some decree, then you have to fulfill it, and another Jewish court cannot nullify that decree. Ella, unless imken gadol hemeno bechokma uveminyan, unless this new court is greater than the other court in number and in wisdom. So, if you have a court that has more people on it and more wiser people on it, then they can nullify what a previous court instituted. Is it one or the other, or it has to be both. Bechokma uveminyan. Yeah, bechokma uveminyan. So, a, a bigger, wiser court can nullify what a previous, what a smaller court instituted. But, another opinion is no, any court can nullify the decree of any court if it's necessary, okay, of a previous court if it's necessary, because, you know, God gave us, God gave the sages the ability to rule as necessary. If the generation requires some new stringencies or some new fences, then God gave the sages that authority to do so. So if a later generation of sages needs to rule over a previous generation, then they can. So Rabbi Barbarhana quotes an opinion that says, no, it doesn't matter. Any court can nullify any previous court if necessary. However, accept those 18 laws. Accept those 18 things that Beit Shammai instituted. Okay. And this is where it gets even more crazy. Because the passage finishes like this. Even when Elijah, Eliyahu, comes back and reestablishes the Sanhedrin. We know that's one of the tasks, one of the things that has to happen before Mashiach comes. Eliyahu has to return, right? It says at the end of Malachi. You remember that verse? Ine anuchi sholeach lachem et Eliyahu hanavi. Before the great day of God, before Mashiach comes, Eliyahu the prophet will return and he will do certain things. And one of the things that has to happen is the reestablishment of the Sanhedrin. Right? Eliyahu has to come also to identify who is the Messiah. Because how are you going to know who is Mashiach? You need a prophet to tell you. You need a prophet to identify him. So. And first you need to identify him, and then you need a genuine prophet to anoint him, because Mashiach means the anointed one. So you need Eliyahu to come back. Why Eliyahu? Why not some other prophet? Because he didn't die. Eliyahu, remember, went up. The Tanakh says that he went up in a fiery chariot. Flaming horses came and beamed him up to heaven, and he never, he, he never died. So he's going to come back.
identify the Messiah, anoint the Messiah, and also they have to reestablish the Sanhedrin. And here it says that even when Eliyahu comes back, Ubeit Dino En Shominlo, that even his Beit Din, even the Beit Din of Eliyahu, we will not list, they, they are, have no permission to nullify these 18 decrees of Beit Shammai. What is that? That's what we have to get, figure out, right? What are these 18 rules and how did this happen and how did Beit Shammai even institute them if we already know that Hillel was always the majority and the law followed Hillel? So how did this happen? That's what we have to figure out. And the story is really wild. So the Mishnah in Masechet Shabbat starts by saying like this, Elu me'alachot sh'amru be'aliyat Hananiah ben Chizkiah ben Garon k'she'alu levakro. There was a sage, there was one of the great leaders 2,000 years ago. His name was Hananiah ben Chizkiah ben Garon. And at one, one time he was very ill and the sages came to visit him when he was sick. Nimnu ve'rabu Beit Shammai al Beit Hillel. And Beit Shammai at that point in that room outnumbered Beit Hillel. So typically Beit Hillel well, outnumbered Beit Shammai. But at that particular moment, Beit Shammai outnumbered Beit Hillel. <laughs> and on that day, they were able to push through and vote in 18 laws. Okay. So this wasn't like an actual like Sanhedrin meeting, but because it was a valid gathering of rabbis, and we have to see why, in this place, in the attic of Hanania ben Chizkia, while they were visiting him when he was sick, there was a valid gathering of rabbis and Beit Shammai was the majority and they were able to vote in by majority these 18 laws. Okay. Now, who was Hanania ben Chizkia? He was one of the great sages of the time. The Talmud says that he was, he was the one that kept the book of Ezekiel, Sefer Yechizkel, in the Tanakh. Because at that time, the sages wanted to get rid of that book, to remove it from the Tanakh and make it one of the books of the Apocrypha, the Sifrei Chitzonim to take it out of the Tanakh because there were certain things that were contradictory in it and maybe it was too mystical and it was going to be removed. And I think that's going to be the subject of our next class, hopefully, about the Apocrypha, to do a little series about the Sifrei the Sifre Achitzonim. Yeah, about the books that were taken out of the Tanakh or never made it into the Tanakh. And Ezekiel was one, Yechezkel was one of the books that almost didn't make it, that almost they were going to take out of the Tanakh. And this sage, Hananiah ben Chizkia, was able to resolve all the contradictions. It says he was holed up in his attic with 300 jugs of oil, and he didn't come out until he figured it all out and resolved all the contradictions, and they kept the book of Ezekiel in the Tanakh. So uh, how did this happen? When did this happen? It seems like it probably happened during the Great Revolt when the Jews were at war with the Romans, so the Sanhedrin was shut down. And so the rabbis had to meet in secret in places like this, in little attics and rooms. That's the only time when they could pass decrees. And so that's probably when it happened. Although some people say it happened earlier, during actual, in the time of Hillel and Shammai themselves, which was before, maybe 70 years before the temple was destroyed. Because remember, the temple was destroyed in the year 70. Hillel died around the year 10 of the Common Era. Right. So Hillel died, passed away about 60 years before the temple was destroyed. And it's possible that it happened in the time of Hillel also, because we know at that time the king of Israel was Herod, Hurdus, and he was persecuting also the rabbis. And it's possible that it happened at that time also, that they had to kind of hide and the Sanhedrin was shut down. So they had to meet somewhere else and not on the temple mount where they would typically meet. The, the Yerushalmi, the Talmud Yerushalmi adds what happened. And it says like this, Oto ayom, that day, Israel kayom ha'egel. That day was as terrible for the Jewish people as the day of the golden calf. That day was as tragic as the gold. That day when Beit Shammai passed these 18 laws was as tragic as the golden calf. Okay, why? What happened? Rabbi Eliezer Omer, that day, Rabbi Eliezer says, that day, Bo bayom gadshu et that day they filled the measure, which means he believed that they did a good thing, that Beit Shammai did a good thing. And Rabbi Yoshua, his colleague, says, they erased the measure, which means they did a really bad thing. Okay, so was this something good that they did, or was it something bad that they did? And why was that day as bad as the golden calf? 
And just a quick recap, these two rabbis, Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua, they were the students of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was a student of Hillel. Just so you see that progression. So it goes Hillel. Hillel had 80 main students. The least of them was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was the leader when the temple was destroyed. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai had five main students. Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua were among them. And then Rabbi Akiva was their student. Rabbi Akiva was a student of Rabbi Eliezer, of Rabbi Yoshua, yeah. So this is who these people were. And Rabbi Eliezer was more of a Shammai person. He was very strict. And Rabbi Yoshua was, was a genuine Hillel person, was very much Hillel, was very lenient. So Rabbi Eliezer says they did a good thing. And Rabbi Yoshua says, no, they did a terrible thing. They erased the measure. And later we also have to discuss the story of Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua, where another Batkol came. Remember that story where Rabbi Eliezer said he was right and Rabbi Yoshua, remember that story? With the Tanur Shalachnai, we'll have to talk about that also. That's another Batkol story where a voice comes from heaven and says Rabbi Eliezer is always right. And Rabbi Yoshua said, no, 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 no. Lo he. We don't listen to Batkols. We don't listen to voices from heaven because that's not true. Yeah. Batkol is like a voice from heaven. Who knows? An angelic voice. Apparently, it resonates for everybody to hear. So, Rabbi Yoshua, why did he think? Rabbi Eliezer thought it was a good thing that they passed these 18 laws. And Rabbi Eliezer said it was a good thing. And Rabbi Yoshua said it was a terrible thing that they erased the measure. They did something terrible. Why? And the Talmud says in Avodah Zarah, it says, Because ein gozrin gzerah you don't pass a decree, you don't impose a decree upon the community unless rov tzibur yecholin la'amodba, unless the community, the majority of the community is able to actually fulfill that law. You can't make the law too difficult. If you make the law so difficult that people can't do it, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to stop keeping everything. And the Talmud quotes a pasuk from, again, from Malachi, which actually the same place, in the same chapter, in the third chapter of Malachi that talks about Eliyahu, it says, atem na'arim atem kov'in ha'goy kulo. That's the pasuk. What does that mean? Literally, it means, it's like you have cursed yourselves, you yourselves are cursed, and then you come to curse me, God says. Right? God is saying, you people have cursed yourselves, and now you are coming, all of you, hagoy kulo, the entire nation, to curse me. What is the meaning of this verse? And Rashi explains, Atem mekablim alechem gzera, you are taking upon yourself a decree that God never commanded, and you are becoming aru, by do, you're becoming cursed, you're cursing yourself by making the loss too difficult. Um, and then, and then you start cursing God because of it. Meaning, the rabbis make a bunch of laws, they're too difficult, so then the masses don't want to keep the law, and what do you think they end up doing? They end up cursing God, and they end up not keeping anything. Not only do they not keep the rabbinic laws, they end up throwing out even the Torah laws. So it's like they throw the baby out with the bathwater and get rid of everything. And we see that that has happened. Rabbi Yoshua was right. When you make decrees that are too harsh and too difficult, people are just going to end up being secular. They're going to say, I don't want any of it. Or you're going to be able to control the people better because you're going to need more. You would hope so. Rabbi Eliezer thought that, no, this is good. We're going to have more control. We're going to have more fences. We're going to make sure that people don't fall to sin. We're going to keep people from sinning. Rabbi Yoshua says, yes, but you're going to go too far and people are going to get so fed up with it, they're not going to keep anything. And then the majority of the nation will become secular. And that's kind of the reality that we're in now. Okay. So that's why Rabbi Yoshua said very presciently that they, they didn't fulfill the measure, they erased the measure. Right. They're, they're kind of destroying Jewish law by making it way too difficult. Okay. Make sense? So now, can I rewind? So Rabbi said, Rabbi Eliezer says that they filled the measure. They did a good thing. They perfected the law. You know, they filled the measure. You're talking about year 10? 18 laws. So we still haven't said what they are. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the big question. What are those 18 laws? You were starting on the structure of the second temple, and then you're 70, and then you came back to saying in the year 10. So 
No, that's just in terms of when did this event happen. Okay, so again, just to recap, there's this event that happened where a bunch of rabbis came to visit a sick sage, their contemporary. It turned out that in that room, I guess there were 70 of them, so it was like a Sanhedrin, and Beit Shammai turned out to be the majority. In that particular room, there were more Shammai scholars than Hillel. And so they were able to actually use that opportunity. Beit Shammai used that opportunity to push through 18 laws that they always wanted to push through, but Hillel would never let them. And suddenly they were able to do it. And they pushed through these 18 laws. Now, when did it happen? Did it happen in the time of Hillel and Shammai themselves? One place in the Talmud suggests that it happened in their own time and that Hillel sat ashamed under Shammai. You know, Hillel, who was older than Shammai, had to sit under Shammai and it was a shameful event. However, you can interpret that to mean that it didn't mean like literally Hillel himself because we also know that Hillel and Shammai actually were good friends and they didn't disagree so much. They only had a few disagreements. So you can read it as saying that the house of Hillel, the school of Hillel was ashamed and sat, you know, kind of suppressed and oppressed by Beit Shammai. In fact, I mean, this is the, the Yerushalmi goes so far as to say that Beit Shammai actually used physical violence and they, they forced Hillel to rule, to, to make it happen. It, to the point where it actually suggests that some of Beit Shammai killed some students of Beit Hillel. Like it got violent to the point of a fatal violence. And, and the Shulchan Aruch even writes that there used to be a custom to fast on the anniversary of this day which I believe was the ninth of Adar, that there used to be a fast day to commemorate this tragedy. But some say no way. There's no way that Torah scholars actually killed each other because we also know from elsewhere that Hillel and Shammai scholars respected each other. So it must be speaking metaphorically. They didn't literally kill each other, but it was such a tragic event that it was as if they killed each other or maybe they did get violent or maybe they did block the doors. They blocked the doors to the attic so no one could escape and forced Hillel into submission and passed these laws while they had the majority. Okay. So that's why that day was as tragic as the golden calf because it was such a terrible episode. So when did that happen? Did it happen around before the year 10 when Hillel and Shammai or Hillel specifically was still alive? Or did it happen around the year 70 or right before the year 70 during the Great Revolt? when Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua would have been there and Rabbi Yochanan would have been there. It seems like they would have been there because they're commenting on what happened. And in terms of historically, it seems to be more likely that it happened before the temple was destroyed. So meaning Hillel was no longer alive at this point. Second. Yes, at the end of the second temple. Because it's hard to imagine that this would have happened under the nose of Hillel and Shammai themselves. That's very unlikely because they were very respectful of each other. So it's most likely that it actually happened at the end of the Second Temple era during the Great Revolt. And we'll see why it had to happen then when we look at what the 18 laws are. Because all of the 18 laws are about separating Jews from non-Jews. And the Talmud really says that all 18 of them are for the purposes of avoiding essentially intermarriage. Why? To avoid idolatry. So Talmud says they really wanted Jews to stop falling to paganism and idolatry. And the main way that people became idolaters, Jews became idolaters, is through intermarriage because they would marry other faiths and other pagan people. And so that would lead them to idolatry. Okay, so really they were trying to prevent idolatry and to prevent that they had to prevent intermarriage. And then to prevent intermarriage, they had to institute these things. So what were they? So the Talmud Bavli, there's a bunch of different lists. And they're not exactly in agreement with each other. It's not clear exactly what the 18 were, but we know what the lists agree on. Okay, so the Talmud Bavli first gives a list, and that the first 10 laws are all have to do with purity laws that don't really apply today. For practical purposes, they don't matter. They were, had to do with the temple. Right? All the different types of purity things that had to do with the temple. So they don't really matter. And the list concludes to finish off the 18. These are the ones that really all the lists basically agree on. And these are the ones that still really apply today practically every day. And it's like this, that they banned pitan. Pita means bread. They banned non-Jewish bread. Shamnan. They banned non-Jewish oils. The Yainan. And they banned non-Jewish wine. Uvnotehen. And the last one, and their daughters. So they banned these four things, bread, oil, wine, and the daughters 
of Gentiles, meaning you cannot intermarry with them. These are kulo mishmona asar davar hen. These were among the 18 that they banned. Okay, so we have bread, oil, wine, daughters. The Yerushalmi gives a couple of lists as well. And there it starts by saying, uh, as well, al pitan shalagoim, on non-Jewish made bread, the al gvinatan, and on their dairy products, on cheese and dairy. And that's where you might have heard of Chalav Israel. That's where it comes from. So we're going to talk about that. The al shamnan, the al bnotein. So again, the same four things. And the, most of the rest deal with just purity laws that don't really practically apply today. But those ones are the big ones. So they banned bread, oil, wine, and the daughters of the Gentiles. Okay? And Rashbi gives a list as well where he even adds vinegar and other things that they banned. But the four things, those four things we want to talk about. The first one is bread. You've heard of the whole thing of Pat Israel. You know, sometimes you go to the store and you see Pat Israel on the bread. So Pat Israel means that a Jew was involved in the production of the bread. At some stage in the production, a Jew was involved. Okay, so some people are stringent to eat Pat Israel, meaning that a Jew was involved in the production of this bread at some point. Is that really halacha or not? Is that a stringency? So Beit Shammai is, this is where it came from. Beit Shammai voted in this law against Hillel in a very violent way, apparently, 2,000 years ago, again, to make a divide between Jews and idolaters. Because they didn't want Jews to fall to idolatry, they said Jews cannot eat bread made by idolaters. Yeah. Now today there aren't really idolaters so much anymore, not like back then. Um, like Christians and Muslims like, wouldn't be considered idolaters for the most part. So, Yeah, so how do you define idolatry, right? They, they were literally like trying to prevent literal idolatry, which today we have figurative idolatry. People have various other kinds of idols, but it's not literal idolatry where they're like bowing down to statues, although that could still exist in some place. Maybe Hinduism. Hmm? Yeah, there's a question if Catholics would be considered idolaters because they do have icons and statues and they pray to, you know, the Virgin Mary and the various saints and things, whatever, angels. So Catholics have a questionable status. Protestants are not idolaters. Muslims for sure are not idolaters. Hindus, again, probably idolaters, again, depending on the type of Hindu. For the most part, yes, that would be considered idolatry. So this could be, this is a question. Uh, in term, can you eat like Hindu made naan bread if it was made by somebody who like worshipped Ganesh in the morning and made naan bread in the afternoon could you eat that bread assuming it has all kosher ingredients so Beit Shammai instituted this law that you cannot eat bread made by idolaters and now over time that became just eating Pat Israel meaning the only way to assure that is that a Jew was involved in the production of the bread at some point now, the truth is, for much of history, this was not something that was observed very closely. And Jews ate bread that was made by their neighbors, by their non-Jewish neighbors. It, that was normal in, in most places. And you might have heard stories. There are a lot of famous stories about, I'm sure you've heard these stories about Jews after Pesach trying to get some bread from their Gentile neighbors. And sometimes they would try to poison the bread. You've heard these stories? There's a whole bunch of them. There's one that happened in Prague. Uh, with uh, the Noda Yehuda, that he saved the mass poisoning of the Jewish community because the bakers, the non-Jewish bakers at the time, or maybe one baker or several, uh, plotted to poison all the bread at the end of Pesach because they know that Jews at the end of Pesach will come to the Gentiles to buy bread because they don't have any. And so there was a plot to poison all the bread. And so it was spared. There's a few stories like that that happen in Jewish history in different places. So, I mean, just to illustrate that Jews did actually consume bread made by non-Jews. The Arizal says, Rav Chaim Vital says about the Arizal, that he was very careful to eat only Pat Israel, which implies that that was a stringency that this great Kabbalist, the Arizal, did when others didn't. So, yes, this law was passed by Shammai in very interesting circumstances, but we see that for, for much of Jewish history, it was considered like a stringency and Jews still ate bread made by Gentiles. And again, it depends on the definition of an idolater, right? Like, really, they were trying to ban bread made by idolaters. So that's bread. That's an easy one. The cheese one is a little more difficult because cheese, we still have this today. 
actually the cheese one is kept pretty stringent, stringently by a lot of people of not consuming gvinata kum, like Gentile made cheese, and consuming chalav Israel, milk that was, again, at some point in the production process that a Jew was involved in in getting this milk, in the drawing of the milk, in the milking process, that's, that's called Chalav Israel. And many people are careful to consume only Chalav Israel made goods okay, and milk. Okay. So again, that comes from here, from the 18 decrees of Beit Shammai. And the Talmud discusses this and says, well, we're worried with milk. We're worried that Gentiles might mix cow milk with other milks. They might dilute it with like horse milk which did happen in some places where you might dilute cow milk with horse milk. And then, of course, horse milk is not kosher because horses are not kosher. So because there was a concern that the milk would be diluted by other things, by other non-kosher things, then you want milk that was produced under Jewish supervision. That's Chalav Israel. But today, when milk is heavily regulated by the government, and nobody is mixing, not in the Western world, nobody is mixing cow milk or goat milk with other milks. So today people are very lenient, like various halachic authorities are lenient with consuming halav stam, with regular milk. So technically milk doesn't need a kosher sign on it. You could buy any milk, like here in Canada or in the United States, because it is just pure milk. Like it's not, it's heavily regulated by the government, yeah. Please fill me in again on what the rationale was for this. And- so the, the Talmud says the rationale was by making sure that Jews won't eat with idolaters. If they don't go to their parties, they don't eat with them, they don't go to their parties, then they won't meet them, then they won't marry them, and then they won't become idolaters. That was the idea. So they wanted to make as deep a separation between Jews and non-Jews as possible. And again, this is what Beit Shammai pushed. And you can understand it, again, if this is happening during the Great Revolt, when they're fighting the Romans and they want to separate themselves from Roman pagans, and they want to make a clear divide. Beit Shammai is very interested in rooting out the, uh, the uh, traitors, the collaborators, the people who are collaborating with Romans, people who may be intermarried with the Romans. Right? In fact, you know that the person who actually, the general who actually oversaw the destruction of the temple was a Jew, believe it or not. So I can send you information about that later. But he was a Jew that had become a Roman. He was a secular Jew. And he was leading the Roman military at the time into Jerusalem. And he destroyed the temple. So, yeah. So I think Beit Shammai really wanted to make a clear division between Jews and Romans, between the people who are serving God and people who are serving pagan idols and things like that. And so they wanted to make this separation by, you can't eat with them, you can't go to their parties, you can't marry them, you know, make a clear separation. So with, with Gvinata Kum, with Gvinata Kum literally means the cheese of idolaters. Akum is an acronym for Ovde Kochavim, for the, the, literally the cheese of idolaters. So not eating the cheese of idolaters and not drinking milk that was milked by idolaters and so on. And that's to this day, you see Chalav Israel, right, on cheese, on dairy products. It's not, it's, there's kosher, but not Chalav Israel. That's like Chalav Stam. Yeah, like an OU or an MK that has milk ingredients, but is not Chalav Israel. And then there's also Chalav Israel. Or right? also, that's right. Okay, so that's, that's dairy. Uh, but today, again, like when the cheese, when the milk is regulated, cheese is a little more complicated because cheese has rennet and rennet originally comes from cow guts, from the, the juice, the digestive juices of the cow. And so that's a problematic thing because if the cow wasn't shechted, is the rennet kosher or not? Now, Italian Jews had a tradition to eat all cheese. You know, I guess that comes with being in Italy. It's lots of cheese. So they always ate all cheese. Uh, but generally, the Allah is that cheese, because it should come, the rennet should come from a kosherly slaughtered cow, then cheese isn't kosher. But today, the cheese market is actually over 90% artificial enzyme. Nobody really uses cow guts anymore. Over 90% of the cheese market is synthetic enzyme made in the lab, genetically modified bacteria, and or something like that, like from yeah. genetic engineering. It's called modified so. milk ingredients, basically. Uh, no, not even just modern, like in actual the production of cheese, they'll use no, milk. In the, in the... No, no, it's called chymosin oh. or like artificial rennet. And so it doesn't come from a cow. So technically, 
cheese today, unless you're getting some like boutique artisan cheese that's like made naturally in the mountains of Switzerland or something, if you're getting like regular cheese, chances are it actually is fine. And again, anyways, Italian Jews ate all cheese, but even today, halakhically, when we're stringent with cheese, now in the last 20, 30 years with genetic engineering and all that, it's all like bacterially produced chymosin, so it's artificial. So you don't have, anyways, the cow guts in the cheese. So you can be lenient. Um, we first talked about the, the bread. Yeah. The bread, there's no need, quote unquote, for it to be. So there's three things here. There's like completely not kosher. There's kosher, but not patisserie. Right? So if you go to the store, you can get bread that has a kosher sign on it. Yeah. But it's not patisserie. So that's fine, right? Like, if some people are stringent and want bread that actually says patisserie on it, which most don't, that can be pretty hard to get. So you, shouldn't, you should not buy bread that doesn't have a kosher sign. Right? Right. You should buy bread that has a kosher sign. And some people are stringent to also buy bread that has a kosher sign, plus it says patisserie on it. Right, on top of that. So it's like an extra level of stringency. So that's, that's with, with the bread. Okay, cheese, again, you have like completely non-kosher cheese. And then you have cheese that's kosher, but chalav stam. And then you have cheese that's kosher and chalav israel. So again, it's like three levels. People tend to be more stringent with this one, with like chalav israel. And, What's the status of... Yeah, it's fine. so mozzarella, again, it's... So what do you do with... If you were to buy, like if you go to the store... If you bought just like non-kosher cheese, it's probably fine, but nobody does that today. You should. Like people just buy actual cheese with a kosher sign on it. Okay, so that's bread. We did cheese. Then another one is, is yain stam. Okay, so there's... Is it, is it no, nesek no, stam? yain stam. Okay, there, again, with wine, there's three things here. First, there's yain nesech. Yain nesech means wine of libation that was used in idolatrous ceremonies. Okay. That is forbidden, of course. Really, the Rambam says in Sefer HaMitzvot that even that's derived. It's not clear in the Torah. Like nowhere in the Torah does God command not to drink that kind of wine. But in Parashat HaAzinu, it says there that God punished us for drinking their Yain Nesech. So because of that, we can derive, the Rambam says we can derive it as one of the 613 commandments that we're not allowed to drink this type of wine. But even that's a derivation. Because the Torah does have a blanket prohibition on participating in anything idolatrous, but it doesn't specifically say wine. And then later, in these admonitions in Chazinu, there God says that you guys you know, went off the derech and drank yein nesicham. You drank their idolatrous wine. So from that we can derive that you're not allowed to drink idolatrous wine, which makes sense. Then there's yain stam, which means it's not libation wine. It's just wine made by Gentiles. When you walk into any liquor store or whatever, alcohol store, you go to LCBO, all those non-kosher wines, they're not yain nesich because they are not used in idolatry. Right? They're just mass-produced wines made wherever by secular people in California. Like it doesn't, nothing to do with idolatry. Hmm? They're made by yeah. Right, and they're mostly just machine-made, exactly. So that's yain stam. It's not yain nesich. Yain nesich would be like maybe if you go to a Catholic church and the communion wine, that would probably qualify. Not probably. I would say that that would be yain nesich. Remember the question right. I posed to you yeah. about the oil that yeah. I got? Oh, I'll get to oil. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So like in a communion wine in a Catholic church, that would probably qualify as ca- the one yain nesich. They haven't used or the one that they no, used? really, by the letter of the law, the one that the priest already oh, turned he, into the blood of right, Jesus, right. that would be <laughs> idolatrous wine. The wine that they still haven't used would probably not be yain nesich yet. That would probably be yain stam <laughs> until they've turned it into, they've used it in idolatry. Now it's yain nesich. Right? But, but that's subject to some debate. I mean, at what point? Sealed, it's not sealed. Yes. At what, at what point does that become yain nesich? That's a question. Is it yain nesich really from the beginning? from when it's harvested, if it was harvested with that intention of, anyway. Actually, that's something, Hillel and Shammai actually debated this, about the status of wine from the point of harvest. Okay. So that's actually, that, that is subject to debate. But generally speaking, wine that was not used for idolatrous purposes or not made for idolatrous purposes, is just made for commercial drinking, use, recreational, whatever, that's yain stam. 
So today the halacha is, and this is the one that everybody is stringent on, that you cannot purchase wine unless it has an actual kosher stamp on it. Right? You cannot consume yain stam. And that's become universal. Although, again, various halachic authorities over the centuries were lenient with consuming yain stam. And where did it come from? It came from Beit Shammai. So Beit Shammai imposed yain stam. That of all things came from Beit Shammai. Yeah. And I'm going to clarify that in a second. Because the next one is oil, which is the shemen Beit Shammai instituted for the same, same, like wine and milk, that you should have oils that were made by Jews, that were pressed by Jews, so and not by adults. Beit Shammai was Italian, that's why he ate cheese. In the <laughs> Beit Shammai wasn't. Maybe Beit Hillel, Hillel maybe was. Yeah, so Italians, it, again, yeah, thanks for reminding me. Italian Jews, again, very religious Italian Jews, would eat all cheese and drink all wine. Really? Yes. So I work with somebody in my yeshiva who comes from a very religious line of, of Italian Jews and rabbis. And I asked him about this, and he said, yeah, like his grandparents, his great-grandparents, they consumed all yain, what? all Italian wine. So then there's oil. So again, same idea, like olive oil pressed at some point that a Jew was involved in the process, supervised the process, so not to eat the, not to consume oil of idolaters. But then the Talmud says in Avodah Zarah that actually this one of the 18 did not take effect. This one was not instituted, or it was instituted, but nobody kept it. Nobody, because it was too difficult, and so it just didn't go into effect. So even in Talmudic times, nobody kept it. Because oil is it's just too useful. You need it for everything, to cook and to eat and to candles. light candles and, and medicinal stuff and to mix. The, like It's just too much. So it's used so widely. Again, people will be stringent, right? Today, in the Orthodox world, if it doesn't have a sign on it, they won't buy it. Yeah, but, I'm the same when it comes to yeah. oil. So yeah, so oil was never, the Talmud says that oil never took effect because it was just too difficult. And again, like we said earlier, that quote that you cannot impose upon the community something so difficult that they can't keep it. So here it actually says in Masechet Avodah Zarah that Daniel, the, the prophet, you know, the book of Daniel, Daniel was the, fir- the first one to do this. Before Beit Shammai, Daniel took upon himself not to consume oil and wine of the idolaters. So it actually goes back to Daniel, but the Talmud says he only took it upon himself. He didn't decree he didn't it upon, it, yeah. yeah, he didn't impose it upon everybody. It was Beit Shammai that imposed it upon everybody. Okay. And the final one, and this is the one that we're going to end with, is the juiciest one, which is al on their daughters. And, and Rashbi's list adds on their sons as well. So what does this mean that they banned something to do with their daughters, yeah, of the daughters, daughters of Idol? But that's, so that's the question now. The, the first thing you're going to say is they banned intermarriage with idolaters or with Gentiles. But what you, what's your question here? Isn't that already banned from the Torah? That's one of the 613 commandments. The Torah already said, don't take their daughters, the daughters of the idolaters for your sons, and don't marry their sons, don't take their sons for your daughter. Right? So the Torah already forbid that. So what does this mean? And then the Talmud actually goes into this in Abu Zarah. It says... And the first thing it says is like this, Benotehen, it's Deoraita. What do you mean that they banned? That's already from the Torah. The Torah already said in Dvarim, it says, Lo titchaten bam, do not marry them. But who is this talking about? The sages say something crazy. They say, wait, first thing is they say, no, Deoraita, the only thing that's forbidden from the Torah is the, the seven Canaanite nations that lived in Israel. Aval shar of kochavim, lo. That the, according to the Torah, apparently, apparently, we're not done here. But apparently, according to the Torah, only the actual seven Canaanite nations were forbidden yes. to marry them. But the other idolaters, other pagan peoples, you Our could country. marry. And they came, the Atu, and they, they made a decree, Gazru, Afilu Deshar of Dekochavim, on everybody else. But, of course, that makes no sense. Because there's no way that the Torah allowed a Jew to marry an idolater. Can't be. And Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai says that the Torah forbids all intermarriage with all Gentiles or idolaters. So what does this mean? So he's saying the Oraita is chatunot in terms of actually marrying them. And what they did, what they came is gazura filu derech znut, meaning they banned any intercourse with Gentile pagans, not even if you want to marry them, but even just for fun. You can't have a girlfriend who's a pagan. 
That was the idea. But then the, the Talmud doesn't like that either. It says, well, what are you talking about? Even that was forbidden from the Torah. How do we know that even that was forbidden? That even just for fun, not in the context of marriage, that even to have a girlfriend or whatever, even, or boyfriend, whatever, that even that was forbidden from the Torah. How do we know? Where do we see that? In what What are passage? you talking about Gentiles? Or are you talking about general? Yeah. Well, for their because, purposes, yeah. they assume, remember, this is 2,000 years ago. So Gentile and idolater is interchangeable. Okay, so this mean, is before there's Christians or Muslims yes, or other. Even allowed to go, go to his, uh, Good. So where, but which episode do we learn it from? And it says, Znut, we learn about Znut, that that was actually instituted by Beit Dino Shel Shem. Shem, the son of Noah, instituted it. How do we know? Because of the story of Yehuda and Tamar. Remember Yehuda and Tamar? Tamar seduced Yehuda. And then when he found out about it, that she was pregnant, yeah, he said, Hotsiyuha v'tisaref, burn her. What do you mean burn her? Why? She already deserved burning. So that means that even then, in the time of Yehuda and Tamar, which is even before Moses, mm-hmm. even before the giving of the Torah, this was already forbidden. But then, what do we learn from Yehuda? Why did Yeh- Yehuda himself didn't co- condemn himself to be burned? He participated too. Why does Tamar, why did he say to burn Tamar? And then he realized that he was the guilty one. Why didn't he? Why didn't he get the death penalty? Really? So the Gemara says that Shem only decreed on Shem decreed against a Jewish woman and a Gentile man, okay, but not against a Jewish man and a Gentile woman. From this story, we learn that Shem's Beit Din decreed only for a woman is forbidden, but not a man. And that's why Yehuda didn't deserve the death penalty for what he did. And then, and then the Beit Shammai came and decreed everything. But then even that can't be the case. Why? Because we learn from another place in the Torah that that's also not allowed. That even for a Jewish man, it wouldn't have been allowed to be with a Gentile woman. How do we know? Which story is that? Exactly. Israel abala ovedet kochavim. How do we know that that's alachal Moshe Sinai? That goes all the way to Moses at Mount Sinai. Because what happened with Pinchas and, Zimri, and uh, Zimri? Remember, Zimri slept with a Midianite woman and Pinchas killed him. And he was allowed to do so. So that means even then it was already forbidden. Okay, so what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that the Torah forbid doing it publicly because Zimri did it in public. He had publicly known that she was his girlfriend, that Cosby was his girlfriend. And what Beit Shammai did is they prohibited it even privately in any context, anywhere, any intimacy with an idolater. That's what they did. That's what al means. The even right. more. And the, the Talmud says that it was actually first banned. This was actually first done by the Hashmonaim in the Hanukkah story, presumably because a lot of Jews had Greek girlfriends at the time. And so the Hashmonaim already instituted that, and Beit Shammai brought it back. We're out of time. There's a lot more to discuss here. But to conclude, two things. Number one, in Masechet Sotah it says, Misherabu talmidei shamay vehilel, shelo shimshu kol tzurkan, rabu machlokot beisrael. That from the time that there was many, rabu talmidei shamay vehilel, once their schools became very big and they had many disciples and the divisions and the debates and the disagreements proliferated and it got to the point that v'naaset Torah kishtei Torot, that the Torah became like two Torahs and it became like two different religions. Beit Shama and Beit Hillel were like just two separate, uh, were so different that they were like two different religions even. So we want to avoid having that. And presumably that's why they ruled that Allah should always just go according to Beit Hillel. Which begs the question, why are some of these things, like these, among these 18, like the Chalav Israel, Pat Israel, Yain on the Yain Stam, why are these a thing? If they are Shammai rules, why do we keep them if we're supposed to go according to Beit Hillel? So that's a big question, and I'm going to leave it unanswered. But there's one Tosefta in Aduyot which says like this, that forever the law should follow Hillel. If somebody wants to be stringent, uh, if somebody wants to be stringent and say, you know what, I'm going to do all the stringencies of Hillel and all the stringencies of Shammai. I'm going to take it upon myself. I personally want to take all these stringencies. 
On this person, they say, the verse in Kohelet that King Solomon said, that this person is a fool who walks in darkness. And so a person who's going to be stringent and wants to take upon himself all these stringencies, they say about this person that they are a fool who walks in darkness. However, a tofes kulei beit shamai ve kulei beit hilel, somebody who's going to go according to everybody's leniencies and say, I want all the leniencies of Hillel and all the leniencies of Shammai, because sometimes Shammai is lenient. There are some cases where Shammai is lenient compared to Hillel. Somebody who's like that, this person is called a rasha. This is a wicked person, right? Who just wants all the leniencies. So if you're going to go according to all the stringencies, you're a fool. But if you're going to go according to all the leniencies, you are wicked. The conclusion is, what you should do is, either go kedivrei beit hilel kekulein vekechamurein, or kedivrei beit shamai kekulein vekechamurein. So either you follow beit hilel strictly, the stringencies and the leniencies, or you follow beit shamai completely, the leniencies and the stringencies. But you can't pick and choose. That's an interesting tosefta. And you also have to keep in mind the first thing that we started, that any Beit Din can nullify anything, but not these 18 decrees. So how do we make sense of all these? And why were those decrees even valid? If Beit Shammai did it by some kind of ruse through violence in an inappropriate situation, why do we even consider that okay? How was this even a valid Sanhedrin? And if that day was as bad as the golden calf, why were they instituted? And if they were instituted under such false pretenses, why did they become a thing except the Shemin? Really, the shemen didn't become, the oil didn't become widespread, but the other 17 did. And why did, the Talmud says, well, because people took them upon themselves. Because a majority of people took them, now it becomes a lacha, because the majority of Israel accepted it. But did the majority of Israel accept it? Because we see for, mo, for much of history, they didn't necessarily accept things like Pat Israel or Chalav Israel. And Italian Jews also were, didn't accept it at all. So was it really ever universal? Doesn't look like it. So what does that mean for us today? What do we make with these 18 laws of Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel? I'll leave that to you.